Ezekiel chapter 37. I want to ask us the question, can our dry bones live? Can our dry bones live? Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around and among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and the skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied, as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We indeed are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live and I will place you in your own land, then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This picture of the valley of dry bones was a sp spiritual picture of the circumstances that the children of Israel found themselves in at that time. They had lost seemingly all hope. That's why they cry out and say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. That's what they really believed. And circumstances backed up, it seemed, what they really believed. Because they'd been transported from their homeland in Babylonian captivity. They had seen the holy temple destroyed. What they thought would never have happened took place. They never believed that God would ever abandon his people and certainly that he would never abandon his holy place, the temple. And so when they found themselves taken away, they were absolutely distraught. They thought that it was all over, that God had abandoned them if indeed there was a God. It wouldn't surprise me that many of them were having a crisis of faith. If there was a God of Israel, surely he wouldn't have allowed this to happen to his people. Surely he wouldn't have allowed false gods to seemingly triumph over the true God and his chosen people. There must have been some great doubts going on about their situation for them to say our bones are dried up. And so God takes Ezekiel in this spiritual vision and sets him down in a valley and it's full of bones and this valley of bones, bones just everywhere that Ezekiel could see, all messed up, not put together. 
in disorganized, disconnected, in total disarray, God shows him this valley of bones and says, behold, later on, he says that this is the whole house of Israel, later on in verse 11. What a picture of God's people. God's people, just a, a bunch of dry bones in a desert. Very, very dry. The people themselves said that they were dry. Now, this is a spiritual vision about spiritual truths. The, the house of Israel was physically alive. They were in captivity, but they felt that their bones had dried up. They were physically alive, but they felt that they were spiritually dead. And when God took Ezekiel into this vision, he saw a spiritual vision of the people, the people that were alive at that time, yet spiritually they were dry bones. You know, this is a picture of their spiritual state. Jesus used a similar picture of the Pharisees' spiritual state. The Pharisees, they thought that they were spiritually mature. They thought that they were the vanguard of God's will and the teachers of Israel. But Jesus once said to the uh, Pharisees that they were whitewashed tombs and that they were all dead bones in that tomb. So Jesus said, you might think you're a teacher, you might think that you're following the Lord and guiding the people and shepherds to Israel, but actually you're open graves, whitewashed tombs. You, you are dead men's bones. What a spiritual picture of someone's spirituality. And of course, this dryness was noted by Ezekiel. And the dryness is important. They weren't just dry. In verse 2 it says they were very dry. They were absolutely dry totally parched, no moisture at all in these bones. Remember, it's a spiritual picture of living people. They were bone dry spiritually. Now, you probably know that the human body is made up of between 60 and 70 percent water. And that babies are even more, they're about 80 or 90 percent little babies uh, made up of water. And here is a picture, spiritually, of them having no moisture at all. And we know that water is a picture of life. We, Jesus speaks about the living water that we can find in him. I'll give you a drink and you'll never spiritually thirst again. It's living water. We know that water is a picture of the Holy Spirit working in the body of Christ. Where here, here are people that are so dry, there's not a drop of anointing on them. There's, there's, there's not a drop of Holy Spirit rain or refreshment in their lives. They're spiritually dead, spirit, spiritually dry. Their bones are disorganized, uh, disconnected, a state of array. Something has happened to the house of Israel. They look like dead relics from a, a past battle that took place. And indeed, battles had taken place, and they had lost. A conquered army, destroyed, forgotten, not even given a basic burial. Remember how particular the Jews were, were, were ceremonially and ritually about dead bodies. This was a dead place. This was a spiritually dry place. This was a place of conquered defeat. And so when God then turned to Ezekiel and asked him the question, can these bones live? It was a difficult question to answer. You would think that Ezekiel, who would had so much of the spirit in his ministry, I mean, if anyone was Pentecostal charismatic, it was Ezekiel, wasn't it? I mean, he's constantly falling down, then being picked up by the Lord, then fallen down. I mean, he is Mr. Charismata of the Old Testament. And you'd have thought, he'd have said, nothing's too difficult for you, O Lord. But this vision was spiritually sapping. And when he looked at the tremendous immensity of this huge valley of dead, very dry bones, and the catastrophe that, that this bones of God's people, the house of Israel, represented... I think that even Ezekiel 
faltered to think that anything good could come out of the situation that he surveyed. And the best that he could do is say, Oh Lord God, you know. If God ever asks you a question uh, and you're not sure, just say, well, you know, Lord. Uh, it's a safe bet. And so this is a picture now. These are spiritual things. And what's happening here is that the Holy Spirit is at work showing Ezekiel the true nature of the circumstances that was going on in the people of God. Everybody knew it was bad, but maybe they didn't realize it was that bad. I mean, everybody knew that it was difficult, but, but for God to show a vision of these bones and say, this is the situation that faces you, the Holy Spirit, when he prepares us for redemption, renewal, perhaps revival, a move of God, he will often illuminate our understanding to see how bad things have really got. You know, to see how bad things have really got, to come to the end of yourself is a very good place to come with God. Because when you come to your end of yourself, you come to the starting point of coming to the beginning of him. And so here is God showing the horrific situation. In these times where we're moving closer to the Holy Spirit, asking him to clo move closer to us, there will be times when he will show and highlight things in our lives that we weren't aware of. Attitudes, uh, reactions, that, that will expose in us how much more work of the Holy Spirit needs to be done. But he doesn't show us how much work needs to be done in our life to condemn us. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. But he shows us how much more work needs to be done in our lives so that we can get serious with him, draw closer to him, rely more on him and his power instead of thinking, hey, I'm all right, I'm okay. God is inviting us to despair of self in order to put trust in him. Can these bones live? Only you know, Lord. And then the Lord told him to prophesy. Can these bones live? Could there be change? Could there be resurrection? Could there be a quickening? Uh, there was no experience in this current generation of such a thing happening. Now we can look back to former times when God moved in different places and at different times, a move of God. And it's all right to read the stories of revival, but it's difficult to connect with them. In fact, when we talk about revivals, very often we talk about the highlights. We talk about when the glory fell. We talk about when hundreds and thousands of people came into the kingdom. We talk about perhaps miracles or, or remarkable conversion testimonies. And when you read the histories or you hear preachers talk about very powerful moves of God, Usually, you're hearing the highlights. But what's not often spoken of is how bad things got in that particular situation before God moved. If you look at many of the revivals that took place in Great Britain, and I've written a book called Land of Hope and Glory, revivals um, through Britain through the ages. You can get it for four pounds. And uh, if, if, you, if you look at it, we always glory in what God did, but we forget how bad things got before Wesley and Whitfield began to preach in the fields and the Holy Spirit turned up. I mean, people believed, even secular historians have been on record saying that if there had not been a Methodist revival, <coughs> then Britain would have gone into a revolution similar to what happened in France. Again and again, in, in the Welsh revivals, you look to see how bad things got before God began to move. In the Hebrides, things weren't good. All these times, there is a place where there's a valley of bones and a recognition by some that it is a valley of bones. You have to be careful not to think everything's all right. I'm all right, you're all right. In the Old Testament, sometimes there were prophets and they would go around telling you you were all right. They'd tell you whatever you want. They'd have conferences, and these conferences would be all about what you want to hear. And people would love what they were prophesying, flock to them, pay them great, because they told them everything's going to be all right. 
and then the real prophets were thrown in prison. They didn't want them coming out because they knew that they would prophesy the way that it really is. Unless we think, see things the way that we really are, how can we expect God to change them? But anyway, the prophet began to prophesy. Prophesy over these bones, he said to them. And here we see another work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit shows things how bad think things really are, but then he says, let's change it. Let's do something about it. And then he said, prophesy over these bones and tell them to hear the word of the Lord. And uh, thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. <clears throat> well, what was this? Well, this was the Spirit and the Word working in partnership to bring about change in a desolate spiritual situation. It was to prophesy. And when you see this passage, it's the Word coated with the Holy Spirit that is going to bring life into dead places. This is illustrative of the preaching of God's Word under anointing. You know, the preaching of God's word has been the spark of revivals time and time after uh, again. Before the preaching of God's word, there is a, a deep distress that is turned into deep intercession about the spiritual dryness of the environment. But then out of that, there comes speaking. There comes bold proclamation. There becomes words, but not just words about Scriptures, not just Bible teaching, not just nice crafted sermons, but in these times there becomes what was called prophesyings. There used to be prophesyings in the Puritan times because they, they weren't, didn't have access to preach three-point sermons in churches. And so they would go out and hire halls and they would go there with what the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit had spoke to them about and they'd begin to prophesy. And where preaching started, and where prophesying of the Spirit ended, well here, Ezekiel was doing. He was speaking to the situation, good news. He was speaking to the situation life. Everything God does, he does by his word, in his Spirit. Think about Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God said. And you have the picture, don't you, of the Holy Spirit hovering. Not the Holy Spirit by himself. Not the word by himself. But when God said, let there be light, immediately, through that Holy Spirit anointed word, light came. These prophesyings can be intercession. These prophesyings can be speaking to one another. These prophesyings can be speaking in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gives us words. We begin to speak the word of the Lord that's stirring in our heart. We begin to give it voice in prayer. We begin to declare it into the situation and we begin to see change. And we see change here, but to begin with, the change is structural. Uh, it was more apostolic, structural connections, divine order coming into this situation. Because what happened... The bones didn't immediately live and start talking, but we see that there was divine order brought into these bodies. He, uh, that he said, as he was prophesying, he says, I was commanded, as I commanded, as I was prophesied, as commanded, verse 7, as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. It was just a, a boneyard out there. But as he began to speak the word of the Lord, an arrangement began to take place. Not just the big bones, but the little bones, the tiny bones. All these bones began to be put into the right place so that bodies that were broken and scattered were being put back together. Arrangements. As the Holy Spirit prepares to come in greater power, you can be sure that there's a great preparatory work Involved, which is as important as when he comes in power. God prepares the ground. God prepares the time. God prepares things. And he arranges. And here he's arranging his people. They're spiritually desolate. They're, they are like dead bones scattered. And so God comes in and starts to bring arrangement and divine order. He's setting the stage. 
He's putting the various actors, if I can use that word, that he's going to use in, in, in the theatre of revival in the right places. It's positional. It's divine order. He's bringing vision. He's bringing apostolic arrangement. The Holy Spirit is as powerful, but the Holy Spirit works as powerfully behind the scenes as he does when he is openly demonstrating himself with great power. We need to recognize that. God is at work very powerfully right now. He was at work very powerfully right there, but nothing was living. There was no great army. And then at the end of this incredible arrangement of putting everything meticulously in order, the finger bones and everything. Oh, that's the wrong body. So the Holy Spirit plucks it up and puts it into a different body. All of this intricate work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is intricate. Do you know that? He's big, marvelous, great and powerful. But he is also interested in the smallest things that are going on in our lives. And so here we see this. And then we have now at the end of this divine order and rearrangement and bringing together, we now have, in that valley, a bunch of soldiers, and their bones are all together, their muscles are all together, and the flesh has come upon them, but there is still no breath in them. And then we get this final thing that Ezekiel's meant to do. He is now not going to prophesy to the people, the house of Israel that is desolate, bone dry, spiritually scattered all over the place. He is now going to prophesy to the Holy Spirit. The picture here is spirit, ruach, spirit, breath, wind. All of these are essential descriptions of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit blows where he wills, Jesus said. Uh, and, and the word in the Greek can also mean the wind blows where he wills. We've got spirit, animated breath. And Ezekiel is so, told to prophesy to the breath because there's no breath in them. What good's an army without breath? And to say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied, imagine that, speaking to the breath. Come breath, breath of God, breathe on these people. Come wind of God in this dry, stagnant valley. Let us feel again your breeze. Let us be able to feel that there's movement going on in the environment around these uh, these bodies that are prepared but not revived. And come, come Holy Wind, come Holy Spirit, come breath of God, breathe stronger. And perhaps Ezekiel began to feel the stirrings and the movings of the environment and atmosphere around this and, and began to speak more Lord, more Holy Spirit, more of your power. This was a time of seeking the Lord to come in power. Very important time. A time of seeking, a time of speaking, a time of prophesying to the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. All this was Holy and Spirit inspired. The very vision was initiated by the Holy Spirit. So I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. What an amazing picture. But the Lord explains this a little bit more. He says in verse 12, Prophesy and tell these people that think it's all over, O oh my people, I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O oh my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and then you will know that I am the Lord. He says that a number of times. Then you will know that I am the Lord. You see, the Lord had set this up. He'd set this all up. He knew that even when he uh, scythed them down into Babylonian captivity, when he scythed them down, brought them low, he knew that even when he was bringing them low, that he was setting up to raise them up again. You know, this reminds me of the God of Abraham. And I just want to finish by going to that in Romans chapter 4. 
Abraham is the father of all who believe. And therefore we are to walk in his footsteps. And uh, you see this picture, because Abraham faced his valley of bones, if I can put it, put it like that. He, 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 he faced a, a valley of bones, a valley of deadness, but the deadness was, was not the, the, the Ezekiel thing. The deadness was in himself and in Sarah's barren womb, even though God had promised that he would have an heir. And when we read from Romans 4, 16, about faith, that's why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares, shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist, in hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he'd been told. So shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, seeing as he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that what God was able to do, that God was able to do what he had promised. Now, who is the God of Abraham? This is very important, linking it. Who is the God of Abraham? If you had turned up to Abraham, and uh, you said, who is this God? Who is this God? And Abraham, well, I can, I can tell you many, many, many things that I've found out about my God to share with you. And you said, no, I haven't got time for that, Abraham, sorry. But can you tell me, if you were to sum up your God the God of Abraham, in two ways, what two aspects would define that this is the God of Abraham? You find it here right now. I have made you, in verse 17, I have made you the father of nations. One, in the, pre uh, in the presence of God who gives life to the dead. If there's one thing the God of Abraham is, he is the God that gives life to to the dead. That's the, he said, that's the first thing I want you to know about my God. My God gives life to the dead. That's why when Abraham took Isaac up onto the mountain, he had no fear at all. He understood now that God was the God who can give life to the dead, and he understood and reasoned with faith that if God even allowed him to sacrifice Isaac, God would just have to rise him, raise him up from the dead again, because he had promised that in Isaac will be your seed. God your God, as you are a child of Abraham, your God is a God that brings dead circumstances and dead people back to life. That's what happens in Ezekiel. So whatever situation you're facing tonight, wherever it seems that the promises of God have died, and, and when you're struggling to have hope when it's hopeless, you can understand that this is the very nature of our God, that he, he, he brings life and gives life to the dead. That's number one. The second aspect of the God of Abraham, if he really had to only sum it up in two things, number one, he gives life to the dead, and number two, he calls those things that are not as though they were. Your name's Abraham, but I don't even have a child, and you're calling me father of many nations. He calls those things that are not as though they were. He brings life into dead circumstances and he calls those things that aren't as though they were. Go and prophesy to those bones and this is what's going to take place. And Ezekiel's there calling them to come together, calling flesh, calling sinews. And then he's calling on the spirit. He's calling those things that are not as though they were. There is a quickening aspect to all of this. One day I was in prayer, just praying about God and the Holy Spirit and situations that needed God to come in power and his spirit. And I had this word just bubble up inside me, quickening, a quickening. And I began to pray to the Lord for a quickening. 
And quickening is often an old word that's used in some of the older versions of the Bible, meaning to bring life. He, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit bringing his quickening power. And I couldn't stop thinking this quickening word was, was in me all the time, so I began to pray that God would quicken me, that God would quicken those around me. I know that word quicken because I remember when I was a child going to church in Yorkshire. I must have been about seven or eight at the time when we used to go to church. And I remember that I always used to get a little bit concerned when uh, in, in the liturgy when we used to say, and he will come and judge the quick and the dead. And the reason I got concerned about God judging the quick and the dead was that I was the fastest sprinter in the school at the time. I thought, well, he's going to judge the quick and the dead. Well, I'm not dead, but I'm quick. I mean, that's how you think when you're seven or eight. That's how I thought. The other one, just so you're interested, how I thought at those days, the other thing I couldn't get my head around was the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. I'm thinking, well, if the Lord's your shepherd, why don't you want him? <laughs> the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. And, I, I, that, and that took me, he said, why don't you ask somebody? Well, I was only seven years old, I didn't think about it. But I got this quickening. And what you see here in the Ezekiel passage is a quickening. These people were not quickened by the Spirit. They were alive, they were in captivity, but something got on them and got them going, got them thinking. When God quickens people, what happens is this. We become alive to the Spirit and we become increasingly insensitive to the world. You see, what happened is that often in these days, uh, the, the, in such days, is that the church becomes alive to the world and dead to God, in a manner of speaking. And it's the world that, that gets us going. It's the entertainment. It's, it, it's the glitter and gold of society. It's politicians. It's, it's sport. It's whatever it is that flicks your switch and turns your light on. And you get quickened by the world, dazzled by the world and all its so-called glory. But when the Holy Spirit comes and begins to quicken us, we become alive to the things of God. We pick up the scripture it's different. It's leaping from the page. It's resonating in, in our heart. We begin to pray, and we find that as we're praying, we're believing that what we're praying is, is, is making a difference. There's an anointing, an enabling, an empowering coming out of our mouth as we speak. When we sit under sermons, we're getting more out of the sermon than the preacher put in, because there's a quickening going on. During these times of quickening, we're, we're singing, we're praising, we're using the same songs, but there's something different because God's on it, and God's on us. And there's a quickening, there's an enlivening, there's an awakening, uh, there's a connection to things of God. Things of, the, of heaven become clear in our minds. We begin to live in the light of eternal realities because we're quickened to them, we're alive to them. Uh, we begin to turn from sin because we understand what sin is and we understand what righteousness is. There's something going on in us. There's something going on on us. There's something going on through us. The Holy Spirit is quickening. Now, next weekend is an opportunity to come together for a quickening. When I say, can your dry bones live. I'm not saying that you, I mean, you, you wouldn't have very dry bones if you're prepared to come out on a Sunday evening to Kensington Temple. You hear what I'm saying? I'm just already speaking into the atmosphere uh, and, and preparing us for a time together in an upper room environment, we pray, starting from next Friday night throughout the weekend. Just clearing the boards and being there, waiting on the Spirit, prophesying to the Spirit, asking the Spirit to come, taking any dry bones that are in us and also representing the dry bones that is in Britain and Europe and, and seeking the Lord for an Ezekiel experience and a quickening. You may already be quickened, but don't you want to be quickened more? Don't, don't you want to be so electrocuted by the Holy Spirit? Do you know what I mean by that? I don't mean pure. I mean, don't, don't you want to be just so alive to the Holy Spirit that the word of God's leaping in your heart, that, that the things of heaven have drawn so close, you feel like you can reach out and grab it? I know you do. There's something inside us, deep inside us maybe. maybe. Maybe there's lots of stuff that needs to get out of the way, but the Holy Spirit is fixing to bring divine order into our lives and to put our broken spiritual joints back together and heal them. How about that? 
Some of us have got some broken joints, broken spiritual bones. Things in our spiritual life is out of, out of kilter. But I prophesy to you tonight that the Holy Spirit is willing and desiring to come and to do some mending in our lives. And to take some of those broken bones, some of these bones have been broken through sin. Some of these broken bones have, have come through being sinned against. But God is fixing on fixing his church. He's going to put his body back together. Individual bodies, individual saints are going to be put back to spiritual wholeness. But every spiritual uh, saint that comes into a quickening, and then another saint comes into a quickening, and there's a mending work of the Holy Spirit, and you're being mended, and I'm being mended, and you're yielding, and I'm yielding, and we're hearing, and you're hearing. And then what happens is these individuals become a corporate body. And God's not only mending individual bodies, but he is mending a congregational body. He is mending a national body, a European body. And when that last <coughs> outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the body of the whole world, Christ's body, will rise up and become a beautiful bride worthy of his coming. If I could have the worship team on right now, I just want you to, right where you are, ask the Holy Spirit to quicken you, to energize you. Right where you are, to quicken you to energize you, to increase his work and activity in you and on you and through you. In you. In you. An increase, a quickening is an increasing work of the Holy Spirit. We pray, Holy Spirit, tonight, throughout this week, that there would be an increase, like it we're not Ezekiel, but we come to you and we speak to you in a manner like Ezekiel tonight. And we say, breath, breathe. We believe that something of the Holy Spirit is in us, causing us to speak to the Holy Spirit. That it's you that is causing a desire in us to cry out and say, Lord, would you breathe on us? Or we remember the disciples. Lord, when you were raised from the dead, you came to them and you, you took them and you breathed on them. It wasn't yet Pentecost, but you breathed the Spirit in them. And it was that breath that caused them to seek the fullness of the Spirit coming. The Spirit of God in us, speaking through us to himself. Would you breathe on us, breath of God? Lord Jesus, would you baptize us in these days? with fresh Holy Spirit and fire. You're the baptizer. Would you send the wind of God in us, and on us and through us? Lord, if there be any dry bones in us, we just come to you and say, Lord, put the spirit of restoration on your dry bone church. Perhaps we think we have a reputation amongst others or other churches. But compared to what you want to do, it's dry bones. Forgive us, Lord, if at times we think more highly of ourselves than we should, or think ourselves more spiritual, like the Corinthians, than we should, or think ourselves more anointed or more filled, or think that we are somehow the high watermark of what's going on. Forgive us, Lord. Let us know that these These, 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 these are just ankle deep experiences of the Lord later on Ezekiel would speak about the river of God that would flow from the temple of God and he'd go ankle deep he'd go knee deep he'd go waist deep and then he'd take the plunge and dive right into the current of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit is real. He listens. He's already at work in your life. So why don't you respond to him right now? A further quickening, Holy Spirit, if you would, in our lives. Quicken our minds to be renewed, to think like you think. Lord, I pray, we pray for our minds. The renewal of the minds, Lord, come. 
make our minds so quick to pick up things of God. Wash our minds, cleanse our minds, fill our hearts. When the Lord turned the captivity of Zion, then were our mouths filled with laughter. As if in a dream, the things we'd hoped for, longed for, believed for, began to come to pass. And our mouths were filled with laughter. And the joy of the Lord, as what was promised, began to manifest. And we had to shake ourselves because we thought, is this really happening, O oh Lord? Are the dry bones really living? Is the resurrection really taking place from the dead? Or are you turning things around again in history? Connect with that which is deep down inside. That's where it is. Deep down inside. In your innermost being. That's where it's all happening. In your innermost being flow rivers. Open your heart again to the Lord. 